David had long since reconciled with his uniqueness, paying no key to the inquisitive stares of others. Nevertheless, the initial acceptance had been far from easy. Sleep evaded him, depression weighed heavily on his shoulders, and thoughts of self-harm had once invaded his mind. It felt as if life conspired against him with an unrelenting series of tragedies. On a particular morning, his slumber lasted longer than intended, leaving him with no option but to catch the bus to university. The bus stop teemed with a throng of people, their countenances marked by discontent. David's premonition hinted at an unpleasant journey ahead. Then the distant wail of sirens broke the monotony. The crowd stirred with newfound energy, drawing David's curiosity. As the source of the commotion drew nearer, David, like many others, edged closer to the sidewalk's edge to gain a better view. His eyes locked onto a car, pursued by three patrol vehicles, careening recklessly down the street, zigzagging in every direction. Danger struck without warning, leaving David with no time to react. In mere seconds, the car careened into the waiting crowd at the bus stop. The last image etched in David's mind was the contorted face of the driver through the windshield before darkness and excruciating pain enveloped him. Later, he would discover that three lives were tragically lost that morning, including the intoxicated driver, while nine others found themselves hospitalized, nursing a range of injuries. After spending a month in the hospital, David received the life-altering news from his doctor. He would never regain the ability to walk. It was a revelation that forced David to contemplate mortality for the first time. His mother, though she tried to maintain an air of normalcy, couldn't conceal her deep concern for her son. She felt utterly lost, unsure of how to help him navigate this new reality. David retreated into himself, often rejecting meals and eventually dropping out of college. Despite the university's wheelchair-accessible facilities, the only solace he found was in a nearby park, accompanied by his mother. Eventually, he ventured to the park alone, seeking refuge in a secluded spot where he could immerse himself in a book. His interactions with others became characterized by rudeness, leading people to lose interest in engaging with him. However, a pivotal moment awaited him. One typical day, while seated in the shade engrossed in his reading, he unexpectedly heard a greeting. Initially poised to respond with acrimony, he looked up to discover a girl of about 12, also in a wheelchair, smiling at him. His surprise was evident as he involuntarily returned the smile. I've noticed you here for a while, but I was too nervous to approach, the girl kindly explained, her laughter ringing with happiness. David, curious, asked, why did you decide to approach me today? His words weren't harsh, nor were they particularly friendly, as he remarked, you seem less angry today. A grin spread across David's face, and a conversation blossomed between them. The girl introduced herself as Jane, once a professional dancer until a fateful day during a demanding competition when excruciating pain seized her back. Subsequently, she learned that competitive dancing posed a dire risk to her spine, necessitating a substantial sum for treatment in Germany. That might work for you, but I don't have a chance, David admitted with a touch of melancholy. And unfortunately, we don't have that kind of money either. Jane responded with unwavering optimism. When I grow up, I'll definitely earn that money, get cured, and then help others. David, wearing a sad smile, asked, but what if the treatment doesn't work? I'll think about that when the time comes. Right now, let's focus on the positive, Jane replied, her smile unwavering. David felt a surge of shame for his past behavior and the pain he had caused his mother. They made plans to meet Jane in the park the following day. Their conversation infused him with hope and tranquility. Upon returning home, David's mother hardly recognized her son. For the first time in a long while, he smiled, requested food, 
and even volunteered to do the dishes. Then to her amazement, he asked for the university dean's contact information to discuss transferring to distance learning. Tears of joy welled up in her eyes as she realized the transformation in her son. Jane's cheerful presence seemed to breathe new life into David, granting him the strength to persevere. He felt ashamed that he, a grown man with countless opportunities, had allowed himself to falter. With renewed determination, David embarked on a transformative journey. Two years passed, during which he prepared for graduation and secured a well-paying online job. His unwavering mission was to support Jane, regardless of the obstacles. Finally, she had a chance at a normal life. One day, Jane's mother, Mrs. Hannah, extended an invitation for David and his mother to visit their modest one-story home. Mrs. Hannah expressed her profound gratitude to the young man for bringing more smiles to Jane's face. David expressed his surprise, saying, I thought Jane was never sad. Mrs. Hannah sighed, explaining, Oh, she used to be full of energy, but the disease changed everything. However, after meeting you, she's been reminding me more and more of her old self. David listened intently, eager to learn more about Jane's past. Mrs. Hannah continued, You see, her father had this idea of turning Jane into a celebrity. He knew about her back condition all along, but kept it hidden from everyone. Mrs. Hannah paused, gazing out of the window for a moment, before continuing, I always worked hard. My husband, on the other hand, didn't make much of an effort. He claimed poor health, saying he needed to take care of himself. So he focused on Jane, and I trusted him, even felt content because Jane was doing well. It was only when our daughter ended up in the hospital with excruciating pain that everything unraveled. Ahead of Jane, there loomed significant competitions with enticing cash prizes. On the day David arrived early at the hospital, he overheard Jane's father desperately trying to convince the doctor to prescribe potent painkillers. He even went so far as to offer money in exchange for allowing his daughter to compete. The doctor, however, staunchly advised against it, cautioning that it could be Jane's last stance. A bitter argument ensued between Jane's parents. On the fateful day of the competition, her mother was at work, confident that they had mutually agreed to withdraw from the dance world. But her world was shattered when she received a phone call at the end of her shift, informing her that her daughter was in the hospital. Rushing to Jane's side, she found her husband there, not filled with remorse for what he had done to their daughter, but rather upset that she hadn't clinched the coveted grand prize. Her anger towards him boiled over. Their world crumbled when they were told that their daughter might never dance again, and even walking with the aid of a cane could be a distant dream. In the aftermath, Jane's father abandoned them, declaring that he had no further role to play in their lives. Thus, Belle and her mother were left alone to grapple with the repercussions. David was deeply moved by this harrowing tale and inquired if there was any possibility of helping Jane. Belle responded, There is a chance, but the financial burden is overwhelming. Surgery abroad is expensive, as is the subsequent rehabilitation. I need to be by her side throughout, which means quitting my job. Currently, I'm juggling two jobs to make ends meet. One of my paychecks goes toward Jane's treatment, while the other covers our daily expenses, Belle explained, her voice tinged with resignation. David was appalled by the cruel absurdity of their situation. He pondered Jane's fate deeply and resolved that he needed to take action. He believed he could make a difference. He was young, intelligent, and possessed ample free time, complemented by a remote job that he was passionate about. Two years passed, during which David meticulously executed his plan. He had a surprise in store for Jane, one he believed would transform her life. He spent countless hours at his laptop, engrossed in his project. 
His mother, pleased to see her son engaged and earning income, didn't inquire into the details. She assumed he wouldn't be making much, so she refrained from revealing the truth she had concealed for so long. In fact, the doctor's prognosis wasn't as absolute as she had initially believed. There was a chance for David to recover, but the cost of the necessary surgery was prohibitively high, a sum they didn't possess. To spare David unnecessary distress, she decided not to disclose this information until the time was right. Today, she had resolved to share the truth with him. However, David excitedly informed her that they were visiting Jane, prompting her to postpone the conversation until their return. Gabriella, like a character in a plot, mused over the surprise. So what's the surprise for an 18-year-old Jane? Are you planning to propose to her? David gazed at his mother with a warm smile and chuckled. Mom, if she were 18, I'd be closer to 30. A proposal? That's quite a stretch. He shook his head good-naturedly. While he had a close and supportive friendship with Jane, helping her with her studies and treating her with affection, he couldn't envision a romantic future between them. Upon arriving at Jane's home, the guests were welcomed with a special cake to celebrate the 10-year age difference between David and Jane. Everyone was aware that David had something planned for Jane, but the nature of the surprise remained a mystery. As they all gathered around the table, David finally spoke, wearing a cryptic expression that held everyone in suspense. I won't keep you waiting any longer, he began. When I first met Jane a few years ago, she turned my whole life around and inspired me to take action. But I couldn't get back on my feet, and she did. So I decided to give her that same chance. I found a way to work online, and it's been generating a decent income. I saved enough money to cover Jane's treatment at the clinic. A stunned silence settled over the room as Jane accepted the envelope containing the documents. It slowly dawned on her that this was indeed true. Mrs. Hannah couldn't contain her tears of joy, but David's mother sat silently, her face pale, realizing the mistake she had made in underestimating her son's determination and love for Jane. David's mother couldn't help but berate herself silently. Why didn't I tell him sooner that he, too, could be helped? She thought. Why did I let him spend that money on that girl? He should have spent it on himself. As her internal turmoil grew, she suddenly remembered an urgent matter that required her immediate attention, and she began preparing to leave. On their way home, David sensed his mother's distress and asked her why she didn't seem happy for Jane. David, my son, she responded, how can I be happy when you gave that girl money that could have gone towards your own treatment? David was taken aback. But mom, he protested, you told me I didn't have a chance, remember? I didn't want to upset you, so I didn't ask for more details. David was profoundly affected by this revelation. When he arrived home, he retreated to his room and wept for the first time in a long while. He didn't regret helping Jane, but the knowledge that he could have helped them, both if he had known sooner weighed heavily on him. After a period of reflection and emotional turmoil, David collected himself and decided on his next course of action. The following morning, David suggested to his mother that they should relocate to another city immediately, citing limited opportunities for personal development in their current location. His mother agreed, and as Jane underwent treatment, David and his mother sold their apartment and left the town behind. After the move, David made the difficult decision to sever ties with Jane. He didn't want her to feel obligated to him out of pity, and he believed it was best for both of them to move forward independently. Natalie was embarking on a new chapter of her life, full of excitement and anticipation. In just a few days, she would be meeting her boyfriend as they both began their first jobs at a prominent IT company. She couldn't contain her happiness about this joint venture. However, unlike her friend, 
Natalie had no intentions of immersing herself in the intricacies of the business or striving to climb the corporate ladder. In Natalie's view, the most crucial aspect was building the right connections, especially with influential men, but her friend held a different perspective. Though Natalie cherished her friend, she found her somewhat dull, as she always seemed reluctant to socialize. They had agreed to rendezvous at the mall, and Natalie speculated that her friend was likely selecting a drab office attire. Natalie, on the other hand, had a penchant for vibrant and luxurious things, and she could indulge in this lifestyle thanks to her father's complete financial support. She had never worked because her father insisted that educated women should either pursue careers or rely on their husbands. Since Natalie had no immediate desire to marry, she saw no reason to challenge her father's stance, particularly since he had promised to buy her an apartment when she secured a real job. This promise held the allure of absolute freedom, a prospect Natalie yearned for, and she was prepared to seize any opportunity to attain it. She considered herself fortunate to have been accepted alongside her friend at the company, as she believed her understanding of the corporate world would be an asset. She also planned to seek her friend's assistance from time to time, further solidifying their bond. Arriving at the mall, Natalie hurriedly entered the parking lot and made a beeline for the only available space. However, as she approached, she noticed a man in a wheelchair occupying the spot. An irate young woman emerged from her car. You've got a fancy car, Natalie remarked mockingly, gesturing towards the wheelchair. There are designated wheelchair spaces at the beginning of the lot. Park there. The woman replied curtly, Excuse me, I'll be right back. I dropped my keys and I can't reach them. She pointed to the keys lying on the pavement beneath her car's front tire, but Natalie didn't offer to help. Instead, she huffed in annoyance, got back into her car, and began searching for another parking spot, leaving David's side. David couldn't tolerate people like her. He couldn't risk standing up to retrieve the keys himself, as his surgery and rehabilitation were now behind him. Although the doctors had given him a clean bill of health, they still advised against putting weight on his legs for another week. Soon, he would regain the ability to walk and embark on a new chapter in life, but the initial journey had been far from easy. Due to the time that had passed, finding a surgeon willing to operate on him had proven to be a challenge. His mother often wept, reminding him that if he hadn't given the money to Natalie, he might have avoided this prolonged ordeal, and the treatment could have been less arduous. He required a second surgery, and then a third, and David contemplated this situation deeply, realizing that he would have made the same choice again. Nevertheless, these challenges forged David into a remarkably resilient individual. They instilled within him a profound sense of purpose, an unwavering work ethic, and an unshakable belief in himself. He had never envisioned that despite his disability, he could establish a highly successful internet marketing company. Most of his employees had never even met him or been aware of his condition, and his top managers, with whom he directly interacted, discreetly respected his privacy. David had chosen to keep his disability hidden to evade both pity and ridicule but the recent surgery had altered his perspective. Now David was preparing to make his physical presence felt at the office, commencing with the launch of a new department in a few days. A passerby handed him the keys to his car, and David expressed his heartfelt gratitude. With a press of a button, the adjacent car's headlights flickered, signaling David to transfer into the driver's seat. He folded the wheelchair with ease, and drove away. It had been a month since he started driving, and he relished every moment of it. He was on the brink of reclaiming the sense of normalcy. On the day of the new department's opening, Everett arrived at the office early. Taking no chances, he settled at his desk in the conference room before anyone else arrived. 
everything was in place for the staff meeting. Natalie and her friend had also made their way to the office. They were informed about the department's novelty and were informed that in half an hour, the company's leader would join the meeting to introduce them and address any inquiries they might have. Natalie perked up. Her preparations and choice of outfit hadn't been in vain. She had donned her shortest and tightest dress with the intention of securing a seat in the front row where she could captivate attention with her shapely legs, potentially paving the way for her future career advancement. She shared her plan with her friend, who responded with laughter. Natalie, what if he's older than your grandfather and doesn't care about your knees? Her friend quipped, why do you always have to spoil my fun and dress like a nun? I'm here to work, not to flaunt my legs to the boss. Natalie hadn't expected any other reaction. Through casual conversations with fellow employees, she had already gathered that the boss was a young man in his 30s, unmarried, and had recently moved to town. Emboldened by this knowledge, Natalie seized her friend's hand and maneuvered her way through the crowd, determined to secure seats in the front row. As everyone settled down, the young man at the table looked up from his papers and began addressing the gathering. To her shock, Natalie recognized him as the same man from the parking lot earlier, the one she hadn't assisted with the keys. Her mind raced as she frantically considered how to rectify the situation and offer a sincere apology. Suddenly, she turned to her friend and found her sitting there with a pale face, tears streaming down her cheeks. Natalie was alarmed and asked, what's wrong? Has something happened? The girl stared in silence at the person who had spoken and then abruptly sprang from her seat, rushing out of the room. Natalie instinctively moved to chase after her friend, but realizing the potential risk to her job, she hesitated and remained in her seat. As David commenced the meeting, he surveyed the room and noticed the same woman sitting in the front row, the one who had insulted him in the parking lot. Amused by the impression he seemed to have left on her, he briefly contemplated teaching her a lesson to discourage future insults toward others. However, as he moved closer to her, he noticed another woman with large familiar eyes fixed upon him. Something in those eyes sparked a momentary hesitation. He proceeded with his speech. It wasn't until the woman with the familiar eyes burst into tears that David recognized her. It was Jane. Struggling to continue, David eventually decided to adjourn the meeting when Jane rushed out of the room. As the attendees dispersed to their respective workspaces, Natalie was taken aback when the boss's personal assistant approached her, requesting her presence in his office. Eager to make amends, she entered his office gracefully, her demeanor subtly exuding confidence. However, her efforts merely earned a smile from David. She perched herself on the edge of his desk and began apologizing for the parking lot incident. David interrupted, expressing his sole interest in obtaining Jane's contact information. Natalie reluctantly divulged Jane's address under David's insistence, leaving her with no choice. The assistant chief then unceremoniously ushered her out of his office. Meanwhile, back at home, Jane sat on her bed, tears streaming down her face as her mother attempted to console her. Jane couldn't articulate her distress, she just sobbed uncontrollably. The last time she had cried so intensely was when she and her mother returned to the city after her surgery only to find that David and his mother had vanished without a trace, changing their phone number and leaving no farewell note. Unexpectedly, the doorbell rang. Mrs. Hannah opened the door to find a concerned David standing there. He leaned on a cane and held a bouquet of flowers in one hand which he presented to the astonished woman. David then promptly made his way to Jane's room. He had always known about Jane's childhood crush, and even then, he had wished for her to meet a regular guy. However, on this day, he realized that she still harbored feelings for him and likely loved him. Several months later, 
David and Jane tied the knot. Initially, Natalie had been reluctant to attend the wedding, fearing that her boyfriend had usurped her position. Yet her curiosity was piqued by David's friend, an escort, and she ultimately agreed to go. David cautioned his friend about Natalie's character, but encouraged him to give it a shot. Though he had his reservations, David refrained from arguing and wished his friend the best. As he watched Jane approach him in her white wedding gown, he realized that life was indeed wonderful. He had built his own successful business, had his beloved wife fight aside, and soon there would be a new addition to their family. For now, it remained their own cherished secret. If you liked this story, hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss another story.